Well, uh, hello everybody. My name is Ashley O'Hara. Some of you might know I'm the curator at the Crested Butte Museum. Um, welcome. I think this is our third to last episode. Ninth so, one. Yeah, we only have two more after this. Um, and yeah, with Dr. Dwayne Vandenbush on Colorado history. Tonight is going to be ski, the history of skiing in Colorado. Yep. Um, and I would like to start the evening off by giving a uh, land acknowledgement. The museum recognizes that we are guests here on this land, historically Ute territory. Uh, we acknowledge that the Uncompahgre and the Tabawash Ute were forcibly removed from this area due to the Bruneau Treaty. Uh, we hope that you will take time to visit our neighbor, the Ute Museum located in Montrose, Colorado, um, and our State Historic Society. History Colorado, um, they've helped curate that museum. While we can never do this history justice, we do include information about Paleo Indians of the Gunnison Valley, the Ute people, the Bruneau Treaty, um, and the Los Pinos Indian Agency in our exhibits. Other ways to support indigenous peoples of today in the past is to go beyond these land acknowledgements. Um, I would also like to say that November is um, the National Indigenous Heritage Month. Uh, this month we can dig a little deeper into indigenous history and present day information as well. Um, I am actually going to post a link right now in the web chat uh, that you guys can save and go to check out after uh, Dwayne is done. Um, this is a government website, so it is safe. And here you will find information, photos, archives of indigenous people, first peoples of America. Um, and you can just learn a little bit more uh, during the month of November and onwards. Um, also, we hope that you consider becoming members of the Crested Butte Museum or making a donation to support this program and all the work we do here at the museum. Um, you can do that by visiting our website, CrestedButteMuseum.com. Those donations will also go to a future series with Duane that we will be hosting here in January on Crested Butte History. Uh, the museum is currently closed right now, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, if you do need something, most are we are there, so you can call us. Um, but we are open Friday through Mondays from 11 to 5. If you would like a private tour, please call the museum at 970-349-1880. And keep in mind that this winter, we're also going to be providing tours with GLOW once again. Uh, we are also going to have two cross-country yurt trails through the Nordic Center, or tours, sorry, through the Nordic Center, going to a hut, and I'll be giving a history tour. And then we're also doing a historic cross-country uh, ski with the CB Land Trust. So look out for that. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be available at CrestedButteMuseum.com or our YouTube page uh, within a few days. Um, if you have any questions about our programming, visit CrestedButteMuseum.com. You can visit our Facebook page or Instagram, um, or you can sign up for our newsletter. And we always have our events in the CB newspaper. Uh, thanks to our lead sponsor, Western Colorado University Foundation, Bill Petros and Bud Bush from Bluebird Realty. Without their sponsorships, these, this program would not happen. And then we'll have time for questions and answers um, after trivia or before trivia. After trivia, I don't know. <laughs> Please post in the chat in the Q&A. That's about it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ashley, and uh, welcome again, everybody. It's great to have you all on board. Ashley tells me we've got about 300 people signed up right now, and I want all of you to consider making a contribution to the Crested Butte Museum. Go to crestedbuttemuseum.com or to my scholarship fund at Western to benefit needy students. To donate to the scholarship fund, just go to westernup.org. A couple of things before we get underway today. I want to tell everybody that on December the 28th, Pete Dunda is going to be playing uh, the polka. His polka band will be at the museum from four o'clock to six, a Christmas polka at the museum. So if anybody is in town at that time, please come on over to the museum. We'll have a trivia question at the end and with one of the books available to be handed out. And this one's going to be on Crested Butte and we'll send it to the person who answers the trivia question first. This is the ninth of 11 sessions, and next week our 10th session is gonna be on the Western Slope of Colorado, something that has always been ignored. When you look at history books, they spend about nine tenths on Colorado and about one tenth, if that, 
on the western slope. So here we go. Tonight's uh, episode or session is going to be on the history of skiing in Colorado. And if any area in the United States was made for skiing, Colorado certainly was. It included the towering Rocky Mountains, 300 inches of snow or more a year, champagne powder, and in the early years, isolation, which forced one to learn to ski in the winter to get around. Ashley, I think you're, uh, you've got uh, our first one on board, and that is Bill Calkins with the long skis in 1924 at the Gunnison Airport, where the Gunnison Airport would be today. Those, of who, those people who came to Colorado were early were fond of saying that the only crop that never fails out here is snow. The earliest skiing in Colorado was done in the 1860s by missionaries bringing religion in the placer miners. Father John Franklin Dyer skied in the Mar Minersville, seven miles from, from today's Crested Butte. Anybody's been to Crested Butte, it's seven miles up Washington Gulch to the north. And there in 1861, he preached to 250 miners at a placer mining camp called Minersville. The route he took in was sensational. He left granite on the Arkansas River south of Leadville, went over Lake Pass, came into Taylor Park, went over to Cement Creek, then to where Crested Butte is today, and then seven miles up north to Minersville, up at the head of Washington Gulch. Father Dyer, that Methodist missionary, later on would write about his experiences in a great book called The Snowshoe Itinerant. Snowshoes at that time meant skis. Itinerant meant wandering. Another man, Father George Darley, a Presbyterian missionary who built the oldest church on the Western Slope, which is still operating in Lake City today. He built in 1877 often skied from that mining camp over engineer and cinnamon passes, both near 13,000 feet, and into mining camps at the head of the Animus River, like Animus Forks and Silverton. And he wrote about his experiences in a great book called Pioneering in the San Juan. When gold and silver mines opened up in Colorado in the 1860s and 70s, thousands of miners flocked into places like Central City, and Georgetown, Breckenridge, Aspen, Uray, Silverton, and Telluride. Most of the early miners were from Canada and Scandinavia, and they were the ones who introduced skiing or snowshoeing as it was called then. What we refer as snowshoes today were called Canadian webs then. The skis they had were nine to 14 feet long, four and a half inches wide. They weighed eight pounds. They had a leather toe piece, a four inch block of wood for a heel piece in the back and beeswax or dope on the bottom to allow for smooth traveling. The skis were made of fire killed spruce because more durable hardwood was unobtainable. The big tips of the skis were boiled in mining camp kettles and then curled upwards in racks. Every skier had a guide pole about seven to nine feet long and that was used as a support and a break, and also to help one move forward when one was on level snow. The only way to turn in those days was to make the telemark turn, which was one ski forward and one ski back, and then you lunge forward in a sweeping turn. In reality, with skis that large, there was little turning. To avoid crashing into boulders or trees, a skier often had to leap off his skis in over the head snow. And the skis were kept from going to oblivion by lanyards or leather straps tied to the skier's belt. One Colorado skier in the early days declared, I would say to those who are about to make their first attempt at skiing, that the one quality to have is confidence. One must at least feel some security. What is needed is conceit. A little of this gives the courage one needs and smooths the ways to success. And that's a, a picture that's not the greatest picture in the world, but that, that's a group of the skiers out in Irwin, Colorado, about 10 miles west of Crested Butte in 1883. 
An early and colorful episode in Colorado skiing involved the famous New York reporter Nellie Bly, the reporter of Around the World in 80 Days fame. She came to Irwin in 1880 to report on a new and booming mining camp in the Gunnison country. John E. Phillips, the editor of the Elk Mountain Pilot newspaper in Irwin, took Nellie Bly out on skis to see the camp. And not being much of a skier, Nellie Bly fell in a deep snow, head first, with her feet sticking straight up in the air. Phillips and his friends with him had a great laugh, and that infuriated Nellie Bly, not used to being laughed at by a bunch of hicks in the Colorado mountains. When she got upright, Bly wagged her finger under Johnny Phillips' nose and said, Sir, it is obvious to me that you are no gentleman. Johnny Phillips was equal to the task and replied, Madam, seeing you in the snow with your feet in the air, it is also obvious to me that you are also no gentleman. To get to the booming mining camps of the Rockies in Colorado was spring dawn. Packers would leave supply points with 100 pounds of goods on their backs early in the morning when the snow had frozen and was solid. And then they would cross high passes, many over 10,000 feet and ski into the camps. They often ski 20 miles, leaving at two o'clock in the morning. They charge $20 for one trip that you could make in a day. A lot of money for that time, but man killing work. Skiing was the only way to get around in the winter in the early days. The high and steep mountains and heavy snow meant that avalanche danger was all around and many a Colorado miner was killed by the white death with his body not found until the following summer. Legendary mail carriers brought mail into the mining camps during the winter months on skis. One of the most famous was a Canadian named Alex Parent who came to Tin Cup in the Gunnison country. Parent had learned to ski in the San Laurentian Mountains of French Quebec, Canada. For 38 years, from 1880 to 1918, Alex Parent carried the mail from St. Elmo on the eastern slope to Aspen on the western slope by horse in the summer and on skis in the winter. His route took him from St. Elmo up over 12,000 foot high Tin Cup Pass into the mining town of Tin Cup then 20 miles north, all the way through Taylor Park, and then over 11,000 foot Taylor Pass and down Express Creek into Ashcroft and ultimately into Aspen. That trip in the winter months on skis took him three days. The most famous mail carrier in Colorado, however, was Al Johnson of Crystal, acclaimed, quote, as the greatest snowshoer in the Rockies. From Quebec, Canada, Johnson became a champion skier. He now carried the mail between the mining camp of Crystal, where he owned a store and mines, all the way to Crested Butte, over 20 miles away. On the way back from Crested Butte, Al Johnson's route took him over 10,700 foot high Schofield Pass, and then through the Crystal Canyon with a 20% grade and his feared devil's punch bowls, large pools of water. When he got to the head of the canyon on skis, Johnson said that to avoid avalanches, he turned his skis loose and shot through the dangerous Crystal Canyon as fast as possible. During the moving mining days of the 1880s, ski races were held in almost every camp in Colorado. The races were held before large and rowdy crowds with up to $100 in prize money for the winter. The greatest race ever written up in national newspapers occurred on Washington's birthday, February 22nd, 1886, on Gibson Ridge, just outside of Crested Butte. If you go to the Colorado Ski Museum in Bale, you can get a great description of that race. A special Denver and Rio Grande train brought a thousand people in from Gunnison to watch. The course was 525 yards long very steep, just outside of Crested Butte, and no snow preparation. A newspaper report said, quote, concerning the details of the race, the intense excitement and great tension of mind and nerve, the half has not been told. 
All the great skiers of the nearby mining camps were there. And after a number of heats, four men who won their heats stood on top of Gibson Ridge, ready for the final race to determine the winner. You're getting a great look now, one of the greatest skiers in the Gunnison country, right in front. The man in front is the great Al Johnson. And that's at Irwin in 1883. The four men who stood on top of Gibson Ridge were Harry Cornwall and Al Fish, two mining engineers from Irwin. The legendary Al Johnson that you're looking at right now, and a 16-year-old boy from Crested Butte, Charlie Bainey. Bainey, the Elk Mountain Pilot newspaper said, quote, was almost raised on skis, and for perfect control of his nerves and muscles, he couldn't be surpassed. The four men leaned forward and then following a rifle shot for the start, shot down the steep slope as if shot from a cannon. A roar went up from the crowd below as the skiers picked up tremendous speed. Cornwall and Fish soon fell behind and now it was Johnson and Bainey fighting it out. The Crested Butte paper described what happened. Quote, Bainey doubled himself up on his shoes and shot down the mountain like a speeding bullet. And I believe that Charlie Bainey went into the first racing tuck in history. Al Johnson's mother didn't raise a dumb kid and he did the same. And as the two flashed through the finish line in front of the cheering crowd at an estimated 60 miles an hour, Charlie Bainey was ahead by 18 inches. One account declared, and I quote, the race was the most exciting ever seen in the Rockies, and we doubt if it's an equal has ever occurred anywhere. You get a good shot now, this isn't the race, but what you're looking at are a couple of guys with guide poles at Crested Butte in 1881 in a race. The bets were paid off after this big race, and then the crowd adjourned into Crested Butte saloons to drink and dance. It was a never to be forgotten day in the mining camps of Colorado. The tour races went on into the Colorado camps until the silver panic of 1893. And then they were turned into ghost towns. And as a popular song said, the good times were all gone and were bound for moving on. Even though many mining camps closed, skiing had caught on in Colorado. And during the winter months, Local skiers hiked uphill to ski in the mountains. One of the greatest ski pioneers after the Silver Panic was a man named Carl Howelson from Norway. Already a champion ski jumper in his country, he came to Steamboat Springs in 1914 and soon designed a ski jump and began to amaze locals with his jumping. And there he is at Steamboat, 1921 going 192 feet, which was a long distance at that time. Howelson helped start the first Steamboat Springs Winter Carnival in 1914 and still continues till today. He entered his grooves on the bottom of skis for better tracking and began to use two poles instead of the guide pole. Today at Steamboat Springs, Howelson Hill is named for him. And Steamboat Spring has used that jump and great complex to turn out over 100 Olympic skiers. By the late 1920s, the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad ran trains through the new Moffett Tunnel, which opened up in 1928 under Rollins Pass. Early skiers rode the train to the West Portal, and some families remodeled construction cabins into ski cabins. The Arlberg Club from Denver in the 1930s pioneered ski runs, which eventually became Winter Park. And there's one of the ski races before World War II at West Portal. You can see the train in the background, and that, of course, became Winter Park later on. In 1936, the May Company put up money for the first rope tow in Colorado at nearby Berthoud Pass. There it is, 1936, the rope tow. On February the 13th, 1938, the Marshall Pass ski train was organized by the Salida and Gunnison ski clubs. Over 400 rode the train to the top of the 10,800 foot high pass from Salida 
and 120 came by train from Gunnison. From the top of the pass, skiers skied 700 vertical feet to the Shawano switch on the west side where they were picked up by the Rio Grande and brought back up for another run for 10 cents. There it is right there. And you can see the skiers kind of coming back to the top of the pass. Thor Groswald was making skis in Denver and later on one of the founders of Winter Park. T.J. Flynn from Aspen and Count Philip Dupuy from Belgium and now a Broadmoor instructor gave lessons on top of the pass. Toboggans also roared down the pass. And a man named Willie the Porter played his accordion and polka music echoed through the mountains. In 1936, not far away, a millionaire named Ted Ryan and Billy Fisk. Billy Fisk was a US Olympic bobsledder, dreamed of a ski area of Ashcroft, 11 miles up Castle Creek from Aspen. And there you can see some of the buildings remaining at Ashcroft. They built the Highland Bavarian Lodge and envisioned a four mile tram that would run from Ashcroft all the way to the top of Mount Hayden at 13,000 feet. And there is the great skier Andre Roach leading Billy Fisk up to the top of 13,000 foot high Mount Hayden. The great Swiss skier Andre Roach featured in this picture you're looking at, surveyed the mountain, laid out runs and said the area was superior to any ski area in the European Alps. For 50 cents, native skier Billy Taggart with a four horse team and sleigh carried skiers up to Little Annie Basin and the bowls of Mount Hayden. Unfortunately, World War II intervened there's Billy Taggart right there. World War II intervened. Billy Fisk was killed early in the war, flying for the RAF in England, the first American killed in the war, and the dream ended. Ashcroft, however, became well known later when Stuart Mace and his sled dogs were used in the television series, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. And there is Mace's sled dogs out of Ashcroft. During the winter of 1939 and 40, the Gunnison Ski Club built the first chairlift in Colorado, eight miles south of Crested Butte and three miles up Cement Creek on the flank of Cement Mountain. And there is the lift, the first chairlift in Colorado with the warming house down below and that lift was called the Comet. The Gunnison Ski Club used abandoned tram cables and towers from the blistered horn mine above the mining camp of Tin Cup and then handcrafted chairs. And there's one of the runs that you're seeing. And I've skied that about 40 years ago and every run is a fall away turn. In other words, you're always leaning in one direction. And there you can see Crested Butte Mountain in the background. The new area was called Pioneer. The lift was called Comet. And the runs were called the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, and the Mil Milky Way. And there you're going down the Big Dipper, one of the steepest runs at Pioneer. An interesting story about the Forest Service, when they put that chairlift in in the fall of 1939, the Forest Service, not used to chairlifts, looked at it and said to the people putting up the chairlift, you know, the damn thing is 25 feet above the ground. If people fall out of the chair, they're going to get killed, lower it. So they forced them to lower it. And then when 20 feet of snow fell, skiers had their knees under their chins because there was so much snow and they were getting flipped out of the chair. The Forest Service needed to learn about ski areas. Across from Cement Creek, local skiers skied on Quicks Hill during the 1920s and 30s. And in addition to skiing, Western State College students and locals played crack the whip and built toboggan jumps. This is a Western State student named Fred Brand going off one of those toboggan jumps on Quicks Hill. He is going at about 35 miles an hour. And Fred told me when he was still alive that he said everybody was afraid of coming off that jump, but we didn't want to be chicken. The two guys watching from the side, they're afraid, and he's got it. Fred's got his flying helmet on as he's going off at about 35 miles an hour. 
It was on Quicks Hill that a Gunnison teenager named Carl Easterly began doing backflips on skis and jumps as he built as he built them in early 1935. And he did these flips off of the ski jump far earlier than anybody else in the US. Now there's a guy named Mill Davis of Gunnison and a couple of Western state skiers in the spring, must have been warm, skiing on Quicks Hill, that's 1939. Later in the 1940s, Carl Easterly appeared on a TV special called You Asked For It, filmed at Sun Valley. Easterly was pulled by a helicopter and a hundred foot long rope. Uh, Ashley, if you got a chance, hook that picture of uh, Carl. There's Easterly right there, doing a backflip in 1938 on Quicks Hill, long before anybody in the US or the world really was doing it. And he was doing it on primitive, primitive bindings and long skis. Easterly at Sun Valley in 1947, was pulled by a helicopter and a hundred foot long rope. He did a backflip over a wooden fence, ski then skied across a 50 yard long pond, and then did another backflip over another wooden fence, all skiing at 40 miles an hour. He was one of the great skiers of the era. And Carl only passed away about five years ago at 94. And when I show a series of these pictures of him, I'd always ask the crowd to give her a round of ovation for the greatest of them all. And then I'd call Carl the next morning and I'd say, Carl, they stood up and gave you a round of applause as the best there ever was in the 30s and the 40s. World War II now intervened after Pearl Harbor. But skiing continued in Colorado with the establishment of the 10th Mountain Ski Division north of Leadville, off Tennessee Pass, near an old mining camp called Pando. The home of the 10th Mountain was called Camp Hale, and it opened up in 1942. 14,300 men trained there during the early years of the war. And there they are with 70 pound packs on their back on Resolution Creek overlooking Camp Hale on a training exercise in 1942. 900 of the men died in the fighting in the Apennines and the Alps in Northern Italy and Southern Austria, including the legendary great ski jumper Torger Tokel and Winter Park's Bob Balch. You ski at Winter Park and they got a run named for him today. When the men at Camp Hale got a leave, they journeyed to Aspen, where they rode the boat tow, which took one 500 yards up Ajax Mountain, and then they skied down. The men slept on the floor of the Hotel Jerome, and to stay warm, they drank a drink with five shots of bourbon mixed with a chocolate milkshake called Aspen Crud. They said they never got cold after drinking it. The Camp Hale boys also had a famous song that went something like this. There are systems and theories of skiing, but one thing I surely have found, the skiing's just good in the winter, but the drinking's good all year round. The men of the 10th Mountain never forgot the Colorado Rockies, and when they returned from the war, they started or developed ski areas that they had always envisioned while at Camp Hale. Those men included Pete Seibert and Bob Parker at Vail, Friedel Pfeiffer at Aspen, Larry Jump at Arapahoe Basin, and Gordy Wren at Steamboat Springs. And the veterans left a great legacy in Colorado skiing. The once great mining camp of Aspen was on its way to becoming a world famous ski area in the 1940s and 50s. From an eight person boat tow in 1938, the old mining camp progressed to chair one in 1946 a single chairlift with a blanket over your legs on each chair to keep you warm. And the man who started chair one was a man from Chicago who ran the American Can Corporation, who came into Aspen in 1946 and put it up. And his wife, Elizabeth, started the famous Aspen Institute, which brought world-class speakers in. I've had a chance in the 60s to ride on chair one. And there you got a good a look at it as you're, some people are riding it up on Ajax Mountain. Today, 
And then in 1951, Aspen got the FIS World Championships, World Ski Championships, and it was on its way. Today, Aspen includes four ski areas, Aspen Highlands, Aspen Mountain, Snowmass, and Buttermill. It's hosted World Cup races. It's got the Red Onion Bar, the Hotel Jerome, the Wheeler Opera House, and legendary skiers like Dick Durrance, Stein Erickson, and Friedel Pfeiffer all skied there and are part of the fabulous history of Aspen. Not far away in early 1957, a local rancher, prospector, and skier, Earl Eaton of the Gore Valley, told 10th Mountain veteran Pete Seibert about a mountain over Vail Pass with treeless back bowls. On March the 19th, 1957, the two men snapped into bear trap bindings and with heavy backpacks on their backs, began to climb what Eaton called No Name Mountain. Using skins on their skis, they took seven hours to climb 3,000 vertical feet to the summit at 11,250 feet. Looking in every direction on top, they saw treeless bowls that went on forever. They had seen the famed back bowls, what later on would become part of the Vale ski area, and today one of the main trails in honor of that seven hour trip that took forever. They got a major run at Vale Call Forever. The Vale ski area opened with a gondola and two double chairlifts in December of 1962. It had a couple of unique characteristics. No auto traffic allowed in the village and something called condominiums. With its enormous terrain, famous back bowls, 300 inches of snow a year, Vail became one of the world's great ski areas. Ashley, I think the next one might show the sign. So if we can hit that next one, that'd be great. There it is. Vail open for skiing. December 1962, and yours truly skied there, didn't know, wasn't a very good skier, I can tell you, about January of 63, and Riva Ridge was my first run. <laughs> it took me a while to get down. Today, Vail is home to the greatest woman alpine skier of all time, Lindsey Vaughn with 85 World Cup wins, and another woman, Michaela Schifrin, will probably surpass her. Michaela now has 70. During the winter of 1961 and two, two Kansas University fraternity brothers, Dick Eflin and Fred Rice, brought the Malensic Ranch at the foot of Crested Butte Mountain and began the Crested Butte ski area with a T-bar and J-bar as the first lifts. There's Dick playing the guitar. His wife, Liz, is on the right. And the guy on the left is Paul Johnston, who had the Ore Bucket Lodge, the first one at the ski area, was actually in, at Crested Butte. And Paul later on owned the Tivoli over at Vail. In January of 1963, an Italian gondola was put in with a very inauspicious beginning. Catholic priest Leo McKenna from Gunnison, following the Italian tradition, blessed the gondola with holy water, but the gondola promptly broke down right out of the shack and was down for the rest of the day. To make matters worse, Father McKenna slipped on the ice in the parking lot after the blessing and fractured his kneecap. Some of the top Galande jumpers in the world came from Crested Butte, and you're looking at the Flying Bambini Brothers, a group of 10 locals who went into a jump all holding hands, did a backflip 25 feet in the air and came down still holding hands. Crested Butte was the first area in the nation to open up extreme skiing with names like Dead Bobs, Body Bag Shoot and Spellbound. The greatest American Alpine skier of them all. And go back to Buddy Werner, please, Ashley was Buddy Werner, keep him on for a moment, of Steamboat Springs, who dominated in the late 1950s and the early 60s in his home country and also against the world's best. 
1958, he won the famous Hahnenkamm downhill at Kitzbühel, Austria, the greatest and most dangerous downhill in the world, the first American to win it. And they say when you win at Kitzbühel, you'll never buy another drink or meal in Austria. Werner was much loved in Europe and became known as the Steamboat Springs Cowboy for the hats he gave to fellow competitors when he returned to Europe. And then tragedy. On April the 12th, 1964, following the Innsbruck Olympics in Austria, Werner was skiing with 12 others in a promotional ski film at Val Saline, Switzerland. At 10 in the morning, a huge avalanche broke loose with Werner and Olympian Barbie Hennenberger in the path. 10 of the 12 were out of the way. Werner and Hennenberger weren't. They skied for their lives and they were only 20 feet from safety when they were engulfed by the snow. The best of all time was gone. Buddy Werner was buried in Steamboat Springs and the name of the mountain there was changed from Storm Mountain to Mount Werner in his honor. Now we go to the next photograph, please, Ashley. There are two skiers skiing off of Monument in 1972, looking at Crested Butte's base area. The golden days of Colorado skiing, when skiing took off, was in the 60s and the 70s, when many new areas opened up. And we all sang the famous song that I'm gonna to read to you right now. And here's how it went. Well, they called him super skier as he sat around the sun deck and swore that he'd never take a spill. When they finally took him down, they had to use three toboggans to carry all the pieces down the hill. He was coming down that slope going 90 miles an hour when he caught an edge on his ski. Well, his clothes, they were fast, but the slopes, they were faster. That's the last of super skier we shall see. Well, he hollered, what the hell, as he put him parallel. He figured there was nothing else to learn. And he started on his way and he was shouting and delay, assuming that he'd never have to turn. Well, he was going down that slope, going 90 miles an hour, when a mogul flipped him up in the air. His jumping form was fine until he ran into that pine and two one-legged skiers left from there. One was going, ski was going east. The other was going west, and both of them were ever running clear. And the folks on Little Nell looked up scared as hell. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's super skier. Today in 2021, Colorado has 27 ski areas, 14 million skier days per winter, and is a $5 billion a year industry. The hundreds of inches of powder snow, the clear blue skies, the beautiful mountain terrain, paradise 140 years ago, and still paradise today. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is skiing in Colorado. And we are now going to get Ashley on to take you to the chat box, where the first one to answer the trivia question is going to get a free book on Crested Butte. So Ashley, fill them in. Um, so please put your answers in the question, the chat box, please. And I will do my best to see who did it first. So just be patient. <laughs> Here is the trivia question. I want to know who the mailman was from Tin Cup who carried mail year round for 38 years between St. Elmo and Aspen over two high passes. Karen not said, Al Johnson, not John Dyer, nope. Not Father Dyer, nope. From Tin Cup, St. Elmo over Tin Cup Pass, 20 miles through Taylor Park, not Buddy Werner, over Taylor Pass, down Express Creek into Ashcroft. Oh, and then, Al, and there we go, Alex <laughs> Parent. No, nope, Dwayne, Vicki, she got it first. Um, she said Alex Perrin. Okay, now Vicki's already got a book. So we're oh, going to okay. go to M. Ellis. Vicki, I hope that's okay. <laughs> M. Ellis. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Vicki. Okay. 
M. Ellis has got it. We'll get your uh, email address. Ashley's waiting to get it. Yeah. Now, ladies so and gentlemen, are there any questions or comments on skiing in Colorado? Happy to try to answer any of them. Doug Carlson's on board in California. He used to be the CEO of Aspen Mountain. So Douglas uh, remembers some of the things I mentioned about Aspen. And Doug, if I had a little more time, I'd have covered a little more about Aspen, one of my favorite towns. Any questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? We're waiting for any comments or questions. <laughs> Dwayne, Mark Walker has says, how often, where are you skiing? Yeah, I ski at Monarch and Crested Butte usually, and I get in about uh, 40 to 50 days a year. Uh, um, it never changed from snowshoeing to skiing, Emily. Uh, snowshoeing was around back then, but in the dry powder snow, they sank into the snow. So it was called snowshoes then, but it was really skiing. So skiing in the 1880s was called snowshoeing. Dwayne, you know that snowshoeing I, today was called Canadian webs back then. I was just gonna say that I learned that the other day about the Canadian webs, and the high schoolers did not believe me. <laughs> yeah, they were called Canadian webs back in the day. Bill, um, put that put that comment you had on again. You had a ski class. I can read it. Who said it? Bill. Bill Grierson Bill said, had skiing as a winter quarter class at Craner Hill. Oh, you did. Wow. And Crashed then. It. Catherine is asking, when did the smaller ski areas like Monarch or Powderhorn get developed? You know, if I had time, I'd have mentioned that. The winter of 1939-40, Monarch started as a WPA project, and that was the same year that Wolf Creek started and Winter Park started, and they all started with a rope toll. But Pioneer started in the same winter, and they had the first chairlift. Let's see. Barbie says the westernup.org does not allow me to find your donation site. Do you have any? Westernup.org? Yeah. Ah, hang on to that next week and I'll, I will uh, give you the way to get to it. That's yeah. what they gave me, westernup.org. And I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Any other oh. comments or questions? Here's some Kara. We have Doug. one. We have one that's far ahead um, from behind. It's called Jennifer, and she says, "Chair one from Aspen at sunlight now." Think so? No. I don't know if it is or not. I think they took chair one, and it's still in Aspen. Doug yeah. might be able to comment on that. I've skied at sunlight, and I know they didn't have a chair one. Uh, two. Okay. Douglas says, or wait, I'll do this one. Kara took a took a class from Sven Wick at Craner Hill as a child when it had a rope tow, Mike. And then Douglas Dart says, our favorite town, Silver Skiing and Society, Aspen has an amazing legacy, but Eldora is pretty cool. Yes, it is. Oh. Uh, Arlene uh, Bernholtz is from Laguna Beach. That's not ski country. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? Mark at says, when researching Gothic, I learned that miners strapped dynamite to their ankles in case of avalanches. Was that a common practice? <laughs> no. <laughs> Although, you know, I would say when they went into the mines, they did have it strapped to their uh, legs. Yeah, keep it warm. Oh, hi, Barbara. Barbara says, I learned to ski at the Broadmoor at night in 1964. Wow, wow. You know, one of my jobs, I'll tell the group in the summer when I was a college student, was uh, working on construction and I uh, blew bridges and stumps up with dynamite. <laughs> and coming back home, if you ever work with dynamite, you always have a splitting headache at the end of the day for the you know little nitro that comes off of it. And, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a, a fun job, but uh, an interesting job. Um, Arlene says, when did Al Johnson race become a costume contest? Uh, you know, the Al Johnson race, I believe, started in the 1970s. It did. And do you know, I also learned that Al Johnson actually dressed up at, uh, I think it was in Crystal, 
in the beginning of one of the winners, three women dressed him up as a woman because they were one woman short at the dance. The Carbondale newspaper at the time in 18, I don't know the exact date, but late in the 1800s. So yeah, so I do think that he would have participated in the Al Johnson today. Yeah. You hang on to that because I want to get that from you when I see you next. Yeah, um, let's see here. Christine says, how much were lift tickets at the start of Aspen skiing? What was the question again? Um, how much were lift tickets at the oh, start of Aspen? When I skied at Aspen in the early 60s and middle 60s, if you showed your Western Slope address on your driver's license, it was $5. If you didn't have a Western Slope address, it was $6. Oh, man. Inflation. They tell me it might be a couple dollars more today. Uh, Steamboat is now two hundred and sixty-four dollars. Yeah, that's that's re ridiculous. <laughs> uh, I agree with you one hundred percent, Patricia. I loved Aspen in the fifties and sixties. <laughs> Mark asks, "Where can I find the Indigenous People list you shared at the beginning?" I will post that in the chat once again. So there you go. Uh, Native American Heritage Month .gov. Um, We have some more questions. Let's see here. Uh, Barbie says five fifty a day in the early sixties, and Arlene says been coming to CB for over thirty years to visit Bob and Mayor Alan Bernholtz. Oh yeah, Patricia. Karen, oh, yeah. Karen Zolenko had a question. Uh, Craner Hill opened up in sixty six, and it's still open today. Whenever they have enough snow, they open it up. Usually. Uh, on, sa on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, it's got a Palma lift. And it was open last year also. So it's run by the city of Gunnison. Mark there were 11 ski areas in Colorado that had or ha have lifts in the Gunnison country. So I'll, I'll tell you what, anybody comes up with all of those, I'll send another book out. Two books. That had or have lifts in the Gunnison country. Any other questions or comments? It's good to have everybody on board. Terry says, we started skiing at CB in December 1965, and a CB pass was 10 bucks. Wow. Yeah, the uh, season pass when I first started in 62 was $60. Yeah, thank you, Judy, for the comments. Appreciate it. I want everybody to remember what I told you at the start now, December 28th, polka dance at the museum, four to six, Pete Dunda and his band. It'll be a lot of fun. I will practice. Thank you, Catherine, appreciate it. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, uh, Patricia. $30 for family members in the late 60s. Yeah, thank you, Darcy. Uh, Ellis, did we get your email address? Hey, Doug. Yeah, thanks a lot, Doug. I got to interview you sometime. If you have a chance, Doug, uh, uh, email me your phone number. I'll give you a call. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Oh, my brother-in-law's father is a living world um, 10th Mountain vet, Barb. Wow, that's great. Oh, he's living? That's amazing. Yeah, Stu, thank you for being on. Appreciate it. Fun times indeed. <laughs> oh, Skeet at Monarch on a student card for $3. A glass of 3-2 beer is 15 cents. Monarch is still a magnificent area to ski at. I skied there 30 times this year, and the... Uh, even though it wasn't a great winter, the powder snow was usually there. Mark, uh, put your question up again. I didn't see it. Uh, Amy said you had a great question. Mark Walker is one of my great students from the old days and an author himself. Mark. Oh. I found his question, Dwayne. Um, how has the ownership of the Crested of Crested Butte changed over the years? When I was there, someone from Atlanta had bought it. Yeah, here's what had happened. Dick Eflin had it, and then it went bankrupt uh, in bankruptcy in '66. 
and the Kansas banks owned it for a while. And then in 1970, Bo Calloway and Ralph Walton from uh, Calloway Gardens outside of Atlanta bought it. And they had it till 2004. And then in 2004, the Mullers from Okemo and Sunapee in the East bought it. And they had it until two years ago when Vale bought it. So they had it from 2004 to 2019, I think. And uh, Vale Associates now has it. Any other questions or comments? I think that if was not, our longest Q&A ever. Yeah, if not, <laughs> I hope to see everybody. Do we know how much Vale paid for it? No, you know, Vale, vale is kind of secretive about those things. They won't even tell you how many skier days they had every year. It's a private company, so uh, they, don't, they don't tell you a whole lot about it. They do have a new beginner lift uh, this year, which is going to be interesting for those who just start skiing. The peach tree lift was taken down. Any other comments or questions, folks? If not, it's Western Colorado next time. So hopefully all 300 will be on board. Thank you everybody for watching tonight. Uh, once again, you can visit our YouTube page. Um, I recently uploaded all the videos um, and they are in order. And then also thank you to our lead sponsors, Western University Foundation and Bill Petros and Bud Bush from Bluebird Realty. And then also remember it is um, National Indigenous Heritage Month. So please check out that website. It has great information on there. So that's about it. Ashley and everybody, thanks very much. Ben and Bush over and out, and I will see everybody next Thursday. Bye. Thank you, folks. Adios. Bye-bye.